Hi, my name is Tiani. I am a junior. Uh, hi, I'm Anthony, and I'm a junior. Uh, hi, I'm Ifan. I'm a senior. Hi, I'm Angeline. I'm a junior. Hi, I'm Eric. I'm a junior as well. Good morning, judges, guests, competitors, and everyone watching. We're a team from Phyllis Academy, and we're here to present our solution to the 2024 M3 Challenge, a tale of two crises, the housing shortage and homelessness. In 2017, the Seattle Times released an investigative report titled Portraits of Homelessness. Pictured here are four of the 22 snapshots that can give but a glimpse into the extent of homelessness. These stories remind us that behind every data point is an authentic human story. Just this week, the Supreme Court heard the uh, Grants Pass v. Johnson court case, which rules on the constitutionality of punitive measurements against stories just like this. Our hope for presenting our solutions to this year's M3 challenge is to help inform government policy and action to alleviate homelessness. Let's get into it. In the first problem, we asked to create a model that would predict the changes in the number of housing units over the next 10, 20, and 50 years. Beginning with our key assumptions, our first assumption is that the number of housing units that can be built in each city, Albuquerque and Seattle respectively, is finite, meaning it is limited by zoning laws and the amount of available, developable land area. Secondly, we take the impact of COVID-19 on the housing supply to be minimal. So our model will include the data on the number of housing units until 2023 that we were given. Third, we say that current construction firms and housing policies will not undergo any drastic changes in the near future. Next, we take rising sea levels caused by global warming to have a minimal impact on the housing market in each city, especially in coastal cities such as Seattle in the near future. And finally, we will take the growth of the housing market to be independent of the type of housing unit that is constructed. That is, whether it is one unit or 20 units, if it is a primary housing unit, our model will consider it. All right, so now let's get into our model. We used a logistic growth model, which measures the growth of a variable that starts exponential, but then becomes logarithmic as it approaches a carrying capacity, which in our case is the maximum number of housing units in a given city. And this carrying capacity is what allows logistic growth models to give accurate long-term forecasts. In addition, a linear regression model was considered, but our team ultimately decided not to use it as for the later years, such as 2070, the predicted number of housing units greatly exceeded our estimated carrying capacity. So on this slide is our model formula and variables. The relative growth rate coefficient and the inflection point were found through our Python program, which utilized the curve fit function in the SciPy library, and the carrying capacity was found separately. And I'll talk about how we did that on the next slide. So for Seattle, our team found a city report that utilized data on vacant and developed land to estimate a housing unit carrying capacity of around 531,770 housing units. In Albuquerque, we utilized land use data from 2017, shown in this table here, and coupled that with the given number of housing units in 2017, and linearly scaled that number up based on land use to estimate a housing unit carrying capacity of around 309,038 housing units. So let's get into our model results. Our graphs for both cities are shown here, and the numbers are shown in the table below. So for Seattle, our model predicted that the number of housing units would grow from around 372,000 to 513,000 in 2070. In Albuquerque, our model predicted that it would increase from around 255,000 to 291,000 in 2070. And so after running our model, we then performed sensitivity analysis. This entailed rerunning our model for each city five times and randomly adjusting each data point by up to 5% for each rerun. We then averaged the resulting percent errors, which are shown in this table. So for Seattle, all our average percent errors were less than 3%, and for Albuquerque, all our average percent errors were at or less than 5%. And this demonstrates our model's resilience to random error. Now we move on to our strengths and weaknesses. Our major strengths in this model is that we utilize this carrying capacity as a limiting factor, which takes into account of the limited land resources available in both cities. And such carrying capacity allows us to make more accurate long-term predictions. On the other hand, the carrying capacity in our model is only an estimate which could be affected um, by future policy changes for zoning laws. Now we move on to the second question. It was the worst of times, which asks us to, cre to create a model to predict homeless population in the next 10, 20, and 50 years. So here are our key assumptions. First, we assume that there will be no natural disasters or other anomalies that affected the homeless population in the future for this 
hard for us to predict such things happening. And second, um, due to abnormalities during COVID-19, we will not consider the data from 2020 to 2022 when calculating the correlating factors in our model. And third, all the independent variables in our model are assumed to be um, normally distributed. Now we'll talk about the details of our model. Given that homelessness likely varies based on a number of different factors, we chose to use a multiple linear regression model. And so to start, we ran multivariate linear analysis and produced the following two correlative heat maps for Seattle and Albuquerque, where darker colors indicate higher linear correlation between variables. And from these two heat maps, we were able to select four factors that had high correlation to total homelessness in each city. And so moving forward, one important thing to keep in mind when running a multiple linear regression model is that the factors we select should be independent in order to create an accurate model with the most simplicity. And so we start by looking at two of our selected factors, total housing units and occupied housing units. We notice that we can test their linear correlation as an indicator of linear dependence. And so as shown, Seattle has a very high R squared value of 0 0.9954, indicating linear dependence. On the other hand, Albuquerque has a slightly lower linear correlation, but we justify that this is due to the nature of Albuquerque as a less highly developed city, but this will change as it grows and becomes more like Seattle. And so we conclude that these two factors are not independent in either city, and so we choose to use only total housing units in our final model. Next, we do the same thing for our other two selected factors, which were median household income and median listing price. And so as shown, we have R-squared values of 0 0.9579 and 0 0.8734, respectively, meaning that these two factors are also not independent in either city. And so we conclude that we can use only median listing price in our final model. Now, before we can run our multiple linear regression model, we first need to project these two factors until 2070. And so we already have, from question one, our results for total housing units. For median listing price, we use a linear model as it's predicted to increase linearly in the near future and receives the following results. For Seattle, the median listing price increases from around 651,000 now to 1.8 million by 2070. And for Albuquerque, it increases from 328,000 now to around 699,000 by 2070. Now that we have the predictions, we can do the multiple linear regression in which we are trying to model homelessness taking into account the two independent variables that we have determined. So here are our model results. The red points are our predicted values in the future and the blue points were the historical points we were given. In Seattle, we modeled an increase from 13,400 in 2022 to 23,200 in 2070. In Albuquerque, we modeled an increase from 1,277 in 2022 to 10,400 in 2070. Now, in order to see how accurate our model's predictions were, we did sensitivity analysis in which we used our multiple regression and we plotted points and predictions for the years for which we were given historical data. Here, the blue points are the actual points we were given and the red points are our predicted values. For Seattle, we had an error of 3.48%, which is low and indicates that our predictions are accurate and robust. On Albuquerque, on the other hand, our error was at 14.3% and I'll get into why this is higher on the next slide. So one of the strengths of doing a multiple linear regression is that it's taking into account two distinct factors, in this case, median listing price and total housing units, that are highly correlated with homelessness. And this gives us more accurate results, as we saw in the low cumulative error for Seattle. However, one of the weaknesses was that there were abnormal fluctuations in the data for homelessness in Albuquerque from 2011 to 2016, which decreased the accuracy of our results. Moreover, the two selected factors that we had were less correlated with homelessness in Albuquerque than in Seattle. Once again, we reason this is because Albuquerque and Seattle are two fundamentally different types of cities. However, as they develop and time passes, the trends in Albuquerque will grow to follow similar trends that happened in Seattle. Finally, we get into problem three, rising from this abyss. This problem asks us to create a model to help a city determine a long-term plan to help address homelessness. We chose Seattle as our model city and make the following key assumptions. First, we assume that certain factors in our model, such as you know, household units and housing unit prices, can model the result of unforeseen circumstances in the future, such as economic downturns and natural disasters, as these Circumstances are bound to occur in the future and must be addressed in a long-term model. 
Second, we assume that government agencies and social services are capable of adjusting the variables in our model through various programs and initiatives. And third, as we had some outside data that was collected monthly, but we only look at homelessness yearly for our model, we assume that monthly data can be adjusted to reflect yearly data, for example, through averaging or aggregating. For our model, we chose to use a Granger causality test. A Granger causality test if, determines if one time series forecasts another and provides evidence for predictive causality between the two. We use a Granger causality test to determine the critical causal factors uh, that impact homelessness and therefore the factors that the government should target when trying to reduce homelessness. A few other key characteristics of the Granger causality test are the lag parameter, which indicates the time period over which causality is measured, and the F statistic, which is used to determine significance. We chose to test lag parameters of one year and two years. Here is our model formula and the four factors that we chose to test. We chose to test unemployment rate as it is correlated with income. We chose to test opioid-related deaths in Washington as a proxy for drug use in Seattle. And finally, we chose to test median household price and number of housing units as these two factors were already shown to be correlated with homelessness in question two. Using a significance level of 0.05 as per statistical convention, we ran a Python program to run the Granger causality test and found the following results. So we found that housing units opioid related deaths and median household prices were all significant over a lag period of one year, whereas unemployment rate was not. Next, we quantify the influence that adjusting any of these three causal factors might have in reducing homelessness through a multiple linear regression model. And so in 2019, one by one, we adjust the data points for each of these three factors by 5%. So housing units would increase by 5%, whereas the other two would decrease by 5%. We can then test the resulting predicted decrease in homelessness one year later in 2020. And so as shown on the graph and in the table, we have the following reduction in homelessness. For housing units, median listing prices, and deaths by opioid use, it reduces homelessness by 2,284, 85, and 360 individuals. As a result, our model is able to provide recommendations to governments for future action in two main ways. For one, our model allows the government to visualize the impacts of unforeseen circumstances on homelessness in each city. And so, for example, natural disasters might cause housing units to decrease, while economic downturns might cause median listing prices to decrease. These can all be adjusted to be shown in our model. Secondly, our model allows the government, through these quantified impacts, to determine the best avenues through which they can target homelessness. For example, the government could choose to create policy changes for exclusionary zoning laws to increase housing units, or create housing funds or taxes on high-value properties to increase financing for affordable housing, or create awareness programs or referral mechanisms to decrease substance abuse. Now let's talk about our strengths and weaknesses. One major strength of our model is that through the use of the Granger causality test, we are able to show predictive causality rather than mere correlation. Through our multiple linear regression model, we can then quantify the impact that these causal factors have in reducing homelessness to provide more specific examples. One weakness, however, is that we do need a linear relationship between variables and that we cannot truly prove causality, although as previously noted, Granger causality shows predictive causality. Now let's summarize everything we've shown here today. In question one, we used a logistic growth model to predict the growth of housing units in Seattle and Albuquerque to 2070, taking into account the critical factor of limited land area, which would have been ignored in other models like linear models. For question two, to take into account the various factors influencing homelessness, we used a multiple linear regression model and selected our factors based on their high correlation. And for our third and final question, we used the Granger causality test to determine factors with a causal relationship to homelessness, and then used a multiple linear regression to quantify the influence these factors might have in reducing homelessness. Homelessness is a growing issue everywhere, not just in Seattle and Albuquerque. Anything that we can do matters, and the time to act is now. Following the competition, we contacted the Harvard Joint Center for Housing Studies, the California Policy Lab, and the National Alliance to End Homelessness. We received feedback that not only do our solutions match the most recent literature regarding homelessness, but that our proposed factors and models truly do have the potential to create change. And so it is our hope that through our models and our presentation here today, that we can help make a difference and work towards a solution to provide a home to many. Thank you so much for listening. We would like to thank M3 and Siam for inviting us here. And thank you to our coach, Mr. Doba, for supporting us and everyone else who's helped us throughout this journey. 
Thank you so much. Great, thank you. Vera, do you want to start us off with a question? Yeah. <clears throat> Probably not. OK. Uh -huh. Thank you. I can, I can start with a question. So um, yeah, so for the first part of the problem, you used the logistic growth model. And then it was uh, pretty clear how you computed the carrying capacity for that model. How did you come up with the growth rate that you used in fitting the data? Uh, yeah, so, so basically, I want to go back to the first slide. All right, thank you for your question. Um, so for the first problem, we had uh, the data points that were shown. Um, one more. Oh, yeah, OK. Yeah, that's um, so, OK. I guess, like, where, hey, where did the K come from? Yeah, so that was, that was calculated through fitting the curve. Um, so we had the logistic function, and then we had all of the points that we were historically given. Um, and then we used the curve fit function, as Anthony mentioned, um, which helped calculate both the growth rate coefficient as well as the inflection points for when it went from exponential to logistic growth. And what is that? So what, behind the scenes, is that growth fitting function something that was in like a software library or? Yeah, so the curve fitting yeah. function is a function within Python which helps fit the curve. And maybe just as a question, like, can you explain to us a bit what is going on in that function? Like, what does it do to choose these, these numbers? Um, yeah, so we're given, uh, do you want to go to the point on uh, the, the graph? Yeah, so um, we're given the, the blue points here. Um, and based off of those points, essentially, it's, we're trying to draw like, um, the line that follows the logistic function. And then by looking for the best fit, it's essentially looking for the curve that has the least error um, of the curve from the points that we were plotted. And then we simply looked at the projections in the future years. OK, great. Awesome. That answers my question. Uh, just a comment. Also, it's great that four of you are juniors. <laughs> Give it a sec. Sorry about that. We're supposed to keep our mics on. Um, so a couple of times you mentioned that Albuquerque and Seattle behaved differently. And you ascribe that difference to um, Seattle being a more highly developed city, right? So can you explain what you mean when you say a more highly developed city and how that did show up in the uh, modeling results, please? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so when we're saying that Seattle is a more highly developed city, on one hand, we're talking about the fact that Seattle is simply a larger city that has a larger population and also a larger homelessness population. And so that means that the trends in Seattle tend to be more stable. And also, the government in Seattle has been working towards policies to reduce homelessness more consistently than it has been in Albuquerque. And that's also part of why the data for homelessness in, um, in Seattle was found to be a lot more consistent and had a lot less random variation. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're thinking a larger population gives a more steady? Um, so you're saying the larger population and then some government policies. Um, I still need you to say a little bit more if you could. Um, yeah. Yeah. So tell me again how that factors into the different results and one model being working well for Seattle but not so well for Albuquerque. What is it? Is there some sort of parameter that you're using? that is, um, I don't know, better modeled or the better represented in one versus the next? Right, so Seattle really just has better established trends than Albuquerque has, as, as shown in um, our, our graphs for the correlation. Um, so while, so we, we attribute this to the fact that because Seattle has a larger population and is, has more established trends that yeah, so part of it is because um, because Albuquerque is like kind of a smaller city than Seattle, mm -hmm. um, and because since it's a smaller city, there's less of a population. Um, then when there are kind of smaller shifts that might not influence as large of a population, such as in Seattle, it has kind of more of an uh, like percentage-wise impact. Um, so for example, like part of the reason why we saw fluctuations in the data for homelessness um, is we did some research and we saw that, for example, um, at that point in time, Albuquerque was trying to make some policy changes. Um, and because it's kind of a, a smaller city, those policy changes tend to kind of enact more easily, which also tend to have those fluctuations, which might not be present when you have a much larger population, which has a lot more stuff kind of going on in that city. OK. So a little bit more sensitive, maybe. Yes. OK. Beautiful. Thank you. Uh, also in question one, you have a table showing uh, the results for the sensitivity um, analysis. Uh, the numbers for Albuquerque are much higher 
than the numbers for Seattle. Why do you think this happened, and what does this uh, say about your model? Uh, yeah, so kind of um, for a similar reason, like because uh, Seattle is kind of already has some of these more established trends. For Albuquerque, which is like um, a smaller city in comparison, as like the, in the next, especially like 50 years, it's going to have a lot more kind of like projected growth, um, both in population and in other ways. So then when we reach like kind of a longer uh, term estimate, the like uh, accuracy of our prediction will go down a little bit. Um, another potential reason for this is because our estimate for the carrying capacity for this was kind of derived through our own method, which uh, mirrored the report that we found for Seattle. However, the report that we used for the carrying capacity of Seattle was through like a Seattle um, development report, which also took into account more factors than we did when we calculated our carrying capacity for Albuquerque. So um, also the carrying capacity for Seattle would be more accurate, which helps with the long-term estimates. Question? Uh, yeah, so in part three uh, in your paper, you talked about cleaning your data. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that and explain more what happened there? Okay, yeah, so um, so in the part three, we took into account multiple different factors, um, some of which we weren't given data um, by the M3 challenge for. So for example, like the opioid-related deaths um, wasn't one that we had, as well as the unemployment rate. Um, and so actually, like for the opioid-related deaths, the way that we initially got the data um, was through like government websites. However, on the websites, the data was, for example, split into like monthly um, intervals. And that was part of one of our assumptions is we wanted to look at kind of year to year. So we, like for example, aggregated um, that also with unemployment rate, I believe that was monthly as well. Okay, I think that wraps, wraps us up, so thanks for the presentation. Thanks.